Hi everyone, welcome to the webinar today. Uh, today's webinar is on sexual harassment in the workplace. My name is Adele Garnett and I'm a senior associate at Hopgood Gannon Moyers. And this is John Hickey, who is a solicitor in our team. Um, we're from the workplace and employment team. So uh, we've been working on these issues of sexual harassment for quite some time. But it's interesting to note the changes that are coming through, uh, particularly in relation to the culture and uh, the, the workplace changes generally. So let's get straight into it. Uh, so in 2017, there was a New York Times article which started a new movement. Uh, the article started with, and I'm just going to read it out here, two decades ago, the Hollywood producer Harvey Weinstein invited Ashley Judd to the Peninsula Beverly Hills Hotel for what the young actress expected to be a business breakfast meeting. Instead, he had her sent up to his room where he appeared in a bathrobe and asked if he could give her a massage or she could watch him in the shower, she recalled in a later interview. How do I get out of the room as fast as possible without alienating Harvey Weinstein, Miss Judd said she remembers thinking. So this article went on to describe many similar experiences by young females, inexperienced in the industry, but very keen to develop their career with a senior person like Harvey Weinstein. One woman, Lauren O'Connor, made this comment. I'm a 28 year old woman trying to make a living and a career. Harvey Weinstein is a 64 year old male, world, world famous, and this is his company. The balance of power is me, zero, Harvey Weinstein, 10. The, this New York um, Times article set the world off into the Me Too movement, which has now been the catalyst to many changes across the world, including in Australia and sexual har harassment has been squarely put onto the agenda. So following that, in 2018, the Australian Human Rights Commission commissioned a survey between April and June 2018. And this confirmed that sexual harassment in Australia workplaces is widespread and pervasive. With approximately one in three people experiencing sexual harassment in, at work in the last five years prior to that. The survey also revealed and I'm just going to read through some of the statistics here, that two in five women and one in four men experienced sexual harassment at work in the last five years. Four out of five people, so about 79%, were sexually harassed by a male harasser. People aged between 18 and 29 were more likely than those in other age groups to have experienced sexual harassment. And fewer than one in five people made a report in relation to sexual harassment. One in five people who made that formal report were then labelled as a troublemaker or ostracised in their workplace. And then another one in five people in those cases, the formal complaint brought almost no consequences for the perpetrator. And where there was some circumstances, it often was just a verbal warning. So these statistics are quite troubling. And following on from that survey, uh, the Australian Human Rights Commission started on doing a national inquiry into sexual harassment in the Australian workplaces. So this all culminated then in the Respect at Work report, which was delivered on the 5th of March 2020. The purpose of the inquiry was to address sexual harassment in Australian workplaces and focus on the nature and the pervasiveness of it, um, the drivers of sexual harassment, and then think about then appropriate measures to address sexual harassment. In delivering the Respect at Work report, Commissioner Jenkins advised that this current legal and regulatory system is no longer fit for purpose. She further stated that, um, and this is the quote that's on your screen now, sexual harassment is not a women's issue. It's a societal issue, which every Australian and every Australian workplace can, contrib can contribute to addressing. The Respect at Work report is very large and nonetheless, though, it is very insightful and worth a read. Um, however, today we're just going to try and give you some of the highlights of that report and also then the following implications of that. Um, John is going to go through a very basic outline of what the law is, just to ensure everyone's up to date, and then go through some recent changes, and he'll speak about a few, um, a few recent cases. Um, I will just say that one of the really key findings of the sexual, uh, sorry, the re Respect at Work report was that there are some very big underlying issues in the workplace that need to be thought about and that need to be addressed before sexual harassment can be eliminated. And these, the first and the main really important one is that power imbalance. The vast majority of sexual harassment cases are about power imbalance. 
And so how can we in a workplace deal with that power imbalance? How can we um, reduce the power imbalance so that those who are in a low level position or who are um, part of a small minority group or who are females, how can they feel like they're empowered to say no? Um, this power imbalance is driven by gender and gender inequality particularly, and also just other diversity inequalities. So that's the first and the main driver of sexual harassment. And then the other three are about what's your organisational culture like? Um, it's also driven by a lack of understanding of what actually is sexual harassment. And lastly, um, to an extent, but not always, and this is somewhat controversial in some aspects, is just generally the use of alcohol in the workplace. Those are what the report says are the four key drivers. So that's what we're going to really focus on today um, when we get to the practical strategies. So uh, to start off with, I'm going to hand over to John, who will talk about this, the law updates, and then I'll get into the practical strategies a little bit later. Thanks, Adele. So what is sexual harassment? Well, sexual harassment um, is unlawful for any workplace participant, such as an employer, an employee, or a contractor, to engage in sexual harassment with another workplace participant either at work or outside of work. In determining whether sexual harassment um, has taken place, personal backgrounds and the relationships between the parties, as well as any other relevant circumstances, are taken into account. Examples of sexual harassment um, include unwanted sexually suggested comments, um, unwanted physical touching, uh, making sexual jokes or innuendos, and the sending of sexually explicit statements or images via electronic media. So what are the laws currently governing sexual harassment in the workplace? All states and territories in Australia have relatively similar sexual harassment legislation enacted. And there is also Commonwealth legislation which makes sexual harassment unlawful. It's up to a complainant which jurisdiction they choose to file an application in. And there are some nuances uh, when considering which jurisdiction to go with. Today, we're mainly gonna focus on the Commonwealth legislation, which applies to all employees in Australia, whether public servants or in the private sector. It's also arguable that an employee might be able to make a sexual harassment case under the general protections regime under the Fair Work Act. However, as we are yet to see such a case, we won't look at those particular provisions in any great detail today. I also note that Queensland is currently undertaking a review of its Anti-Discrimination Act, with a report to be presented to the Attorney General of Queensland by the end of June next year. So in relation to the Commonwealth Sex Discrimination Act, Section 28B provides that it's unlawful for an employee to sexually harass a fellow employee or a person who is seeking employment with the same employer. Section 28A of the Sex Discrimination Act then provides that a person sexually harasses another person if the person makes an unwelcome sexual advance or an unwelcome request for sexual favours or engages in other unwelcome conduct of a sexual nature in circumstances in which a reasonable person having a regard to all the circumstances, would have anticipated the person would be offended, humiliated, or intimidated. The key elements of sexual harassment in Section 28A are that there is a sexual advance, request for sexual favours or other conduct of a sexual nature. Now, conduct of a sexual nature has been defined broadly to include, for example, declarations of love, uh, telling jokes of sexual innuendos, making gestures of a sexual nature, uh, and brushing up against a person. Sexual harassment may be subtle rather than uh, explicit or obvious. It frequently, but not always, involves an abuse of power, as Adele mentioned earlier. And it's often directed at a person who may not be able to stop the, the behavior quite easily. The conduct can occur at work or outside the workplace if it occurs in connection with work. So for example, outside of work functions, uh, during travel that's connected with employment, um, as well as social media between work colleagues. The next element is that the, the, that the behaviour is unwelcome. Unwelcome conduct is conduct that was not solicited or invited by the employee, and the employee regarded the conduct as undesirable or offensive. Whether the, the behaviour was unwelcome is a subjective question from the perspective of the particular person who is alleging the sexual harassment. It is irrelevant that the behaviour may not have been unwelcome to others, or it's been accepted, an accepted feature of the work environment in the past. Sexual harassment, however, is not sexual interaction, flirtation, attraction or friendship, which is invited, mutual, consensual or reciprocated. The next element is that a reasonable person in the circumstances would have anticipated the possibility that the person harassed would be offended, humiliated or intimidated. 
It's important to note that, unlike bullying, a single incident can constitute sing, uh, sexual harassment. The Act does not require ongoing or consecutive instances of unwelcome sexual conduct to amount to sexual harassment. The final element is taking into consideration all the circumstances. Section 28A provides a non-exhaustive list of what should be taken into account, including the sex, age, sexual orientation, uh, relationship status of the person harassed, the relationship between the person harassed and the person who made the sexual advance or request, any disability of the person harassed, and any other relevant circumstance. In relation to the liability of employers, Section 106 of the Act provides that employers may be vicariously liable if an employee commits sexual harassment and the employer did not take all reasonable steps to prevent the employee from doing these acts. A major difference between the jurisdictions is that the Commonwealth Act applies only to specified areas of public life, including employment, education, the provision of goods and services, accommodation and clubs. Accordingly, sexual harassment that occurs outside of these areas, for example on the street, uh, is not unlawful under the Commonwealth Act. On the other hand, Queensland and Tasmania, for example, both prohibit sexual harassment without any restriction to specified areas, such as the workplace. Another major difference between the jurisdictions is that under state and territory legislation, complaints about sexual harassment must be made within 12 months of the incident, whereas under the Commonwealth jurisdiction, the time limit is two years. If an application is made under the Commonwealth jurisdiction and it's unable to be resolved by the Australian Human Rights Commission, the next step is for an application to be filed in the Federal Court or the Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia. If the matter proceeds to either of these courts, then costs will be incurred to run the matter to trial, although reasonable legal costs can then be sought and recovered by the successful party. In the alternative, if, sexual harassment, if a sexual harassment application is made under a state or territory jurisdiction, both parties will generally be required to bear their own costs for the proceeding. In several jurisdictions, such as Queensland, for a party to be awarded costs, they must establish that it is in the interest of justice that the other party should bear their legal costs. I'm now going to talk about the Commonwealth legislative amendments on sexual harassment. So as Adele mentioned earlier, the Respect at Work report offers a suite of recommendations that improves the legal and regulatory framework relating to sexual harassment in Australia. Relevantly, the report provides for specific amendments to the Commonwealth legislation dealing with sexual harassment, including the Sex Discrimination Act, the Fair Work Act, and the Work Health and Safety Act. In April 2021, the Commonwealth Government agreed to in full, in principle, or in part, to 46 of the 55 recommendations in the Respect at Work report. The Government then noted the other nine recommendations set out in the report, including the introduction of a positive duty in the Sex Discrimination Act for all employers to take reasonable and proportionate measures to eliminate sex discrimination sexual harassment and victimisation in their workplaces. Now, although no explicit positive duty has been imposed on employers in relation to sexual harassment, employers do have a work health and safety duty generally for their employees. And so it is important that employers are proactive in ensuring the responsibility of dealing with sexual harassment in their workplace does not solely fall on the shoulders of the victim. On the 11th, Septem the 11th of September 2021, the Sex Discrimination and Fair Work Amendment Act commenced operation. The Amendment Act gives effect to several legislative amendments recommended in the report, including introducing a new object clause in the Act, which provides that the Act aims to achieve, so far as practicable, equality of opportunity between men and women. It inserts a new provision in the Discrimination Act to make it expressly clear that it's unlawful to harass a person on the ground of, the sick, of their sex. This new provision uh, prohibits any harassment by reason of the sex of a person, for example, a woman's pregnancy, or a characteristic that relates to or is attributed to persons of the sex of a, pers of a person, for example, uh, women and carers' responsibilities generally. This amendment addresses the report's finding that many women experience harassing conduct based on their sex, but which is not necessarily sexual in nature. The Act also expands coverage of the Sex Discrimination Act to include interns, volunteers, self-employed workers, members of parliament, uh, and judges. This is in response to a number of very, very public allegations of sexual harassment, including the Brittany Higgins matter and the former court, High Court Judge, Justice Dyson Hayden. The Amendment Act also clarifies that victimising conduct can form the basis of a civil action for unlawful discrimination, in addition to a criminal complaint. It extends the time period to file a sexual harassment complaint to two years, as I've mentioned earlier. 
Uh, it also clarifies that sexual harassment can be a valid reason for dismissal under the Fair Work Act by amending the definition of serious misconduct. The definition of serious misconduct under the regulations is not exhaustive. So while sexual harassment uh, was not specifically in the definition previously, it has, it has always been a valid reason uh, for dismissal in the right circumstances. And finally, it allows the Fair Work Commission to make stop sexual harassment orders to prevent sexual harassment in the workplace, irrespective of whether the conduct occurred once or on multiple occasions. To make such an order, the Commission must be satisfied that sexual harassment uh, did occur and that there is a material risk of the harassment occurring again if an order is not made. Employers must be cognizant of these changes and ensure that their current workplace policies and procedures are up to date in accordance with the Amendment Act. So what compensation can be awarded to victims of sexual harassment? Well, prior to the decision in Richardson and Oracle in 2014, where damages awarded were increased on appeal from $18,000 to $130,000, compensation to victims in the sexual harassment jurisdiction was quite conservative, often around $20,000. In determining which jurisdiction to file a complaint under, it's important to note that the Commonwealth Act and the Queensland Act do not have a statutory cap on compensation to be awarded to victims. The maximum amount of compensation that can be awarded for a breach of sexual harassment legislation, however, is expressly limited to $40,000 in Western Australia, $60,000 in the Northern Territory, and $100,000 in New South Wales. There are three types of damages that the court or tribunal may award a complainant. Those are general damages, which compensates victims for loss of employment and career, a severe psychological illness and loss of enjoyment of life. Special damages, which compensates victims for past and future loss of earnings, uh, loss of other employment benefits, um, such as superannuation payments and overtime payments, and past and future medical expenses. And the final uh, damages is aggravated damages, which compensates victims for the distress and hum humiliation experienced due to the harasser's unlawful conduct. Aggravated damages, however, are compensatory in nature. Damages to punish the harasser and deter similar conduct in the future cannot be awarded to a victim of sexual harassment. Other remedies may include reinstating, uh, re-employing, promoting or increasing their salary, requiring undertakings by the harasser not to repeat the conduct, uh, or the transfer or dismissal of the harasser. These remedies, however, are very rare because in most circumstances, the employee who has been harassed does not want to return to the workplace. As will be discussed, both courts and tribunals are increasingly willing to award higher amounts of aggravated damages for hurt and humiliation in harassment claims when the evidence demonstrates a significant impact on the claimant and that the harassment is of an egregious nature. So John's going to just go through now a few cases, particularly about um, these increases in awards to damages, which are really important for workplaces to keep in mind. Uh, and the, the reason they're really important is obviously because the huge risk to running one of these cases. Interestingly, in a lot of uh, sexual harassment cases, uh, not surprisingly, you don't see all of the wide spectrum of what sexual harassment can be. So with the ones, the cases we're looking at today, they have been, uh, for the most part, awarded quite large sums of damages. But there are many, many cases that are resolved by conciliation or mediation in earlier stages during the court case. So these are really just the tip of the iceberg ones that we're looking at today, but they provide us with some guidance on, on a numerous different things that we're looking at. So the things about general damages, about how much it could cost if you don't deal with um, sexual harassment in the workplace, but then also looking at the broader issues about when sexual harassment might be uh, think in things like social media, in when is it outside of work. So we really want to bring to you today just a few of the, the most recent cases in the last few years, which might guide your practice and guide your um, development of some practical strategies. That's right. So in the very recent case of Vitality Works and Yelder number no. 2, the New South Wales Court of Appeal upheld an early decision of the New South Wales Civil and Administrative Tribunal to award $200,000 in general damages to a female employee who experienced sexual harassment in her workplace. It's important to note that this case considered a breach of the New South Wales Anti-Discrimination Act, where, as I previously mentioned, there is a statutory limit on damages of $100,000 against each respondent that can be awarded by the tribunal. In this case, Sydney Water engaged Vitality Works, a workplace health and occupational wellbeing company, to implement a work health and safety program called SafeSpine. 
the Sydney Water female customer liaison officer, was asked to have her photos taken to be used in posters for Safe Spine, and she agreed, not knowing what format the poster would eventually take. Vitality Works was responsible for the design, the publication, display, and distribution of the poster. The posters were printed and displayed in the workplace, including outside the male toilets. In the poster picturing the female employee, she had her right hand above her head pointing to the slogan, Feel Great, Lubricate. The female employee was, unsurprisingly, mortified to see her picture used in such a manner on the poster. As a result, the employee lodged an anti-discrimination claim alleging that she had been sexually harassed by both Sydney Water and Vitality Works and discriminated against on the grounds of her gender by Sydney Water. She submitted that the words feel great and lubricate suggested the use of lubrication during sex and that the slogan along with her photo suggested that she was a sex object in her workplace. Sydney Water and Vitality Works argued there was nothing sexual about the poster and that the slogan referenced lubricating the joints and spine in the context of workplace health and well-being. They argue that the fact that the female employee interpreted the slogan differently did not mean that the poster was sexual in nature. The Court of Appeal made a number of findings about the meaning of sexual harassment under the Act. It emphasised that whether conduct was unwelcome is a subjective question to be determined by, the, by reference to the complainant's state of mind. However, the question of whether it is conduct of a sexual nature is determined objectively. Importantly, and this is the same under the Commonwealth Act and the Queensland Act, the intention of the alleged perpetrator to engage in sexual harassment is not relevant. The court emphasised that sexual harassment could include sexually suggestive jokes and comments, including those of a double meaning. The court rejected Vitality Works' argument that conduct cannot amount to sexual harassment unless it's sexually explicit stating that this argument overlooks the infinite subtlety of human interaction and the historical forces that have shaped the subordinate place of women in the workplace for centuries. The court found that Vitality Works, as a company engaged by her employer, Sydney Water, fell within the meaning of a workplace participant under the Act, and the conduct for which Vitality Works was actually responsible was plainly unwelcome conduct of a sexual nature by making the employee the poster woman for sexual self-lubrication to her all-male colleagues. In accepting that the conduct of more than one actor uh, may be the subject of a sexual harassment finding, the court held that both Vitality Works and Sydney Water were each responsible for the poster and had directly contravened the act. Accordingly, the court found in favour of the employee and dismissed Vitality Works' appeal. The court accepted that the employee suffered from a psychological injury, which she has not recovered from due to the display of the poster in the workplace. After considering relevant case law, the court confirmed that general damages should be awarded in the sum of $70,000. In terms of special damages, the court considered that the past economic loss suffered by the employee was in the sum of just over $240,000. The court also found that the apology provided uh, to the employee by Vitality Works was insincere, minimal, and was far from a proper apology for their conduct. The court considered that the apology was unjustifiable and that the failure of Vitality Works to provide a full and proper apology caused the employee considerable upset and hurt feelings. A further $5,000 was awarded to the employee by way of aggravated damages. Now, despite calculating the employee's total loss and damages in the amount of just over $300,000, due to the statutory cap, uh, Vitality Works and Sydney Water were each ordered to pay the employee the maximum cap of $100,000. One interesting thing to just remember there and to note is that there is no cap in Queensland or uh, in the Sex Discrimination Act, as John said earlier. So um, while that amount of $318,000 was brought down to $200,000 in Queensland and under the Sex Discrimination Act, potentially those amounts would not be capped. Hmm. So it can lead to huge uh, reactions, although in Queensland to date, we have not seen such large uh, sums awarded. That's right. So other than not, as Adele has said previously, sexual harassment in the workplace occurs due to a significant power imbalance between the parties. In many circumstances, the power imbalance um, impacts on the ability of the victim to resist or expressly indicate uh, that the sexual conduct is unwelcome, and it often perpetuates the harassment um, or exacerbates its impact on the harassed person. The courts take into account the power imbalance between the parties when considering whether there has been sexual harassment and in determining damages. The more significant the power imbalance, the higher the general and aggravated damages awarded. This is evident in the 2020 case of Hughes and Hill. In this case, the full court of the Federal Court of Australia upheld the decision to award a socially and individually vulnerable paralegal, Miss Hill, 
uh, who was sexually harassed by her law firm employer, Mr. Hughes, $170,000 in compensation, comprising $120,000 in general damages and $50,000 in aggravated damages. This decision is quite significant as it's the highest award of aggravated damages in a sexual harassment claim under the Commonwealth Act. In summary, Ms Hill commenced working at Mr Hughes' firm in northern New South Wales after having separated from her husband. She had been admitted as a solicitor and she wanted to remain living in the region to bring up her children. Mr Hughes was a senior legal practitioner and promised Ms Hill that he would assist with her legal career development. Shortly after commencing at the firm, Mr Hughes offered to represent her in a mediation against her ex-husband. Ms Hill accepted that offer. As her lawyer, Mr Hughes gained access to very privileged information, including information about former relationships, uh, relationships with other men post-separation, uh, and apprehended violence orders she had taken out previously, uh, and her anxiety disorder. The night prior to the mediation, Mr Hughes called Ms Hill and expressed his growing feelings of infatuation towards her. She was upset at these comments, but chose to ignore Ms. Mr Hughes. Following the mediation, uh, Miss Hill accompanied Mr Hughes on a work trip to Sydney. The sleeping arrangement was for both Miss Hill and Mr Hughes to have their own separate bedrooms. However, on two occasions, Mr Hughes entered her room in only his underwear and refused to leave until she gave him a hug. Feeling both personally and professionally compromised, Miss Hill reluctantly gave Mr Hughes a hug so that he would just leave her room. After returning from the work trip, Mr Hughes persisted with his predatory behaviour regularly sending Miss Hill inappropriate emails, coercing hugs from her in the workplace, and threatening to end her employment unless she entered into a romantic relationship with him. Now, although Miss, Miss Hill repeatedly requested for Mr Hughes' behaviour to stop, he discontinued to do so. In one email, Mr Hughes stated that he was very careful not to harass her and would defend any complaint made by her against him. In another email, he criticised her work ethic but said he could live with it if they were lovers. Mr. Hughes eventually commenced a relationship with another employee at the firm and ceased sending these emails uh, to Ms. Hill. However, following a disagreement in relation to work completed by her, Mr. Hughes used the confidential information obtained while acting as a representative to criticise her professionalism and work. Mr. Hughes then reduced her working days to two days per week, claiming his assessment of her ability had been clouded by his earlier infatuation with her. Ms Hill subsequently resigned and commenced proceedings against him for sexual harassment. In court, Mr Hughes argued that the emails were sent after work hours, that the hugging occurred uh, at the end of the workday. In making these arguments, Mr Hughes was trying to establish that the conduct did not have a sufficient connection to the workplace as required under the Commonwealth Act. Mr Hughes also claimed that Ms Hill was flirty with him and wore alluring dresses and flicked her hair in a sensual manner in asserting that she was actually really interested in him. Referring to several of his inappropriate emails, the court noted that by his own admission, Mr. Hughes knew he had been sexually harassing her and had attempted to bribe her into not making a complaint in exchange for allowing her to remain employed. In response to the submission that Ms. Hill had encouraged his actions by her work attire and her alleged flirtatious behaviour, Judge Vasta asserted, it's a mark of a bygone era where women, by their mere presence, were responsible for the reprehensible behaviour of men. The Sex Discrimination Act was enacted to help eliminate this sort of thinking. In finding that the sexual advance was unwelcome, offensive and humiliating, the court ordered that Mr Hughes pay Ms Hill damages in some of $170,000, dollars of 120 in general damages and 50 k in aggravated damages. The general damages were awarded for the pain, suffering and distress that was endured by Ms Hill. The court accepted the medical evidence that she had suffered an adjustment disorder with anxiety and depression due to his conduct. Aggravated damages of 50,000 were awarded in light of his attempts to stop her from making a complaint and on the basis of the manner in which he conducted himself during the trial. Relevantly, he inappropriately and in breach of his professional obligations as a lawyer, used confidential information obtained to slander her during the proceeding. Mr. Hughes appealed this decision. In dismissing the appeal, the full court of the Federal Court of Australia held that the $120,000 in general damages was not manifestly excessive in light of his conduct. The full court also upheld the decision to award 50,000 aggravated damages given his dishonourable attempts to deter her from making a complaint and the reprehensible manner in which he conducted himself. 
This judgment demonstrates the recent tendency of the Australian courts and tribunals to award and uphold significant sums of general and aggravated damages in sexual harassment cases. This is a reflection both on community standards uh, and also on the huge impact that sexual harassment does have on victims. Sexual harassment that occurs after work or away from the workplace may also be considered to have occurred in the context of employment. This will be the case if there is a relevant connection with an employee's employment. Uh, for instance, during business trips and training courses, conferences, social occasions outside of work, such as work functions or Christmas parties, the pre-employment process, such as in a job interview, um, as well as in some instances on social media. The widespread use of social media platforms such as Facebook, LinkedIn and Instagram has certainly changed the way that employees work and how they interact with colleagues outside of the workplace. While social and work lives were once kept quite separate, it's now common for employees to have their personal details, communications with friends and photos visible on social media to not only their work colleagues but also to their managers and even to clients. It's also becoming increasingly more common for employees to vent their frustrations um, on social media platforms. Whether employees should be dis disciplined for social media comments made in their own time has been the subject uh, of much debate. However, recent case law makes it quite clear that employees are to be held accountable for such comments. In the Fair Work Commission case of Luke Colwell and Sydney International Container Terminals, an employee was found to have engaged in misconduct when he sent a pornographic video via Facebook Messenger to a number of his co-workers, including three female employees. The worker contended that his employer did not have a valid reason for his dismissal because the conduct did not have a connection to his workplace. He argued that the conduct occurred outside of work hours. It didn't involve any work-related equipment or facilities, and the individuals involved were other employees of the company who had self-selected to be a Facebook friend of his. The commission determined that an explicit video sent outside work hours via Facebook to a group of colleagues was a valid reason for dismissal. The commission agreed with the employer that the requisite nexus to his employment had been made out as the recipients of the video were only connected to him through their mutual employment at Sydney International Container Terminals. The commission also noted that the employer had taken steps to encourage women to participate in employment within their male-dominated industry. Therefore, it was in the interest of the employer, as articulated through their various workplace policies, to adopt a zero-tolerance approach to sexual harassment. Now, while none of the female recipients reported the matter to the employer, the commission accepted that the employer had an interest in investigating matters and came, that came to its attention relating to potential harassment, and that an employer's actions should not be contingent on receipt of a formal complaint. While the commission didn't make any findings as to whether the conduct constituted unlawful sexual harassment, it said that the conduct by the applicant affected the employment of the recipients who received the video, which was unwelcome and had the potential to offend them. Accordingly, the commission held there was a valid reason for the workers' dismissal. In light of the above, it's vital that staff are aware by employer policies and education that comments, posts and messages they make to or about other staff by email or on Facebook or other social media sites uh, can constitute sexual harassment and may result in disciplinary action such as their own termination. Employers should be particularly mindful of conduct on social media uh, that is sexual harassment or inappropriate behaviour that impacts on the workplace. Um, these, this includes uh, managers or supervisors connecting with or communicating with junior staff on social media. While this may be a common occurrence, um, issues in relation to power imbalance can arise under the circumstances. Employees posting inappropriate photos or commenting on other people's inappropriate photos. And employees repeatedly contacting other employees to invite them out socially in circumstances where the invitee has made clear they do not wish to socialise with that person outside of work hours. I was just going to say, make a few comments about that case. I think some of the, one of the really key points that I find in that case, and John may be about to talk about this, but is, is just that there was actually no finding of sexual harassment. There wasn't an, a person who that sexual behaviour was directed to. But it's really important for um, situations when you're the HR manager in the workplace, whether you're the manager in the workplace, to deal with all instances of inappropriate behaviour because you just never know when someone else might see that message, despite the fact that the conduct between the two parties may be consensual, there could be somebody else who sees it. And in those instances where perhaps not referring to um, a case where it's 
been sexual harassment that's been found, but it is a case where uh, there's a breach of a code of conduct. There's a breach of inappropriate behaviour in, uh, of, of appropriate behaviour in the workplace. It's a culture we want to be able to address. And so that's a really key finding in this one is that there wasn't sexual harassment as such, but there was inappropriate behaviour and it needed to be addressed. Um, another key point there is it was actually a private message between the employees that the employer became aware of um, by some way or another. So as John said, there was no complainant, but that doesn't stop you at your responsibility as a, work, as a HR manager, as a manager in the workplace for dealing with things, despite the fact that you don't have someone who's willing to put up their hand for it. Thanks. Yeah, that's right. In addition to social media, um, sending inappropriate emails or texts which contain explicit or pornographic imagery can also result in sexual harassment complaints. Importantly, even as Adele just mentioned, even if the conduct is not unwelcome uh, and therefore isn't strictly sexual harassment, uh, it may still be serious misconduct and a valid reason for dismissal because it's a breach of the employer's code of conduct or workplace policies, or just because it generally is unacceptable, unacceptable behaviour by society standards. In a recent Fair Work Commission case, a 63-year-old male employee, Mr Clark, made an unfair dismissal application after his employer, Toll Transport, conducted an investigation and found that his text messages to a younger male employee were inappropriate, offensive, vulgar, and of a sexual nature, contravening Toll's code of practice. Text messages revealed that Mr. Clark, in resisting a request for money from the younger employee, sent incredibly sexually explicit and vulgar language via text message. We've decided to not read them out to you today because they, they were highly unpleasant. So anyway, yes, you can go and right. look it up for yourself if you want to see what the words were. So Mr. Clark submitted that the language used in the text messages were similar to how other employees in the workplace spoke with one another. Toll submitted that Mr. Clark had been provided with workplace policies that included a requirement not to sexually harass or act inappropriately towards other employees. Toll denied that this sort of language was used throughout their workplace and considered that uh, Mr. Clark had acted dishonestly throughout the investigation process. The Commission found that the recipient of the text was not an innocent player in the text dialogue, so that the conduct was not necessarily unwelcome, and nor was it actually exceptionally harassment. Despite this, the Commission held that toll transport determination that the texts were inappropriate and of a sexual nature was appropriate in the circumstances, and therefore there was a valid reason for dismissal. At the hearing, toll couldn't establish to the, work, uh, to the Fair Work Commission's satisfaction that it had issued its code of practice to Mr. Clark, uh, but accepted that the conduct need not be in breach of the company's policies to warrant a valid dismissal, as the conduct itself could be regarded as wholly inappropriate. Further, the dismissal was, although somewhat procedurally deficient, not unfair in the circumstances. The Fair Work Commission placed particular relevance on the fact that the text messages were communicated within workplace hours although I noted that there were boundaries relevant to acceptable conduct with respect to work colleagues, which should not be crossed outside of those work hours. Employees should remember that text messaging, text messaging work colleagues, even from private phones, either at or outside the workplace, uh, ought to be done in such a way that it does not harass, embarrass, or intimidate the recipient. Text messages to the contrary, um, as we can see through this case, uh, can be grounds for valid dismissal, whether or not an employer has specific policies that have been breached, if the conduct can be regarded in all the circumstances as wholly inappropriate. Adele is now going to talk about the practical strategies uh, to deal with sexual harassment in the workplace. Thanks, John. I did forget to say earlier that we do have a questions button there that you are very welcome to submit your questions to us on. Uh, we probably will only have a very short period of time to answer some questions, but we do intend to, uh, where possible, get back to you on some of those questions after the presentation. So feel free to submit them um, at any time. So none of the changes really that John's spoken about in relation to the, the changes to the legislation are massive changes to anything that is going to impact on your workplace on a day-to-day -day basis. What the bigger changes really are about are uh, this progression of uh, society just not accepting sexual harassment, which then is going to be reflected in how an organisation's reputation is treated if a matter of sexual harassment comes out into the media. And also, uh, as John spoke about, those awards of court damages, which I can only see going up. So what we're talking about today then is some ways that you can practically address sexual harassment in the workplace. Um, in deciding what will be actually appropriate for your workplace, 
it will be important to remember those drivers of sexual harassment, which I spoke about earlier, which is that power imbalance driven by uh, gender and other inequalities. So uh, addressing those underlying issues. Uh, your cult organisational culture. So the, the Respected Work Report talks about how if your organisational culture uh, accepts inappropriate behaviour generally, joking around, that kind of stuff, then it's more likely to be a workplace where there's a risk of sexual harassment. And also another, those other underlying factors of just a lack of understanding of what sexual harassment is and the use of alcohol in the workplace. So as an overall comment, one key way to, uh, key to addressing sexual harassment in the workplace is to have that leadership and management support and commitment to the issue. Success really depends on any of your strategies being publicly supported and endorsed by the board or by senior management and by managers and supervisors. So in coming up with your overall strategy and plan, it's therefore important to get that leadership buy-in. The Respect at Work report makes the really key point that those traditional approaches to sexual harassment, dealing with it in the workplace in their own, have not actually been successful in reducing sexual harassment. Um, in particular, we're talking about really the two main strategies that most organisations come up with, which is having a policy and providing staff with training. These things don't actually create the cultural change that's needed, although they are very important and I will address them. Um, so in the past, this education and having a policy has been the way that uh, employers have sought to avoid vicarious liability in relation to sexual harassment. And this is certainly what the cases have indicated to date, is having those kind of key parts uh, to your workplace uh, will help you avoid uh, vicarious liability. However, in our view, this is not going to be the way to avoid vicarious liability in the future. Um, it's over time likely to change. Um, and we'll have to look at the consider the wider cultural changes and the respect at work report. So that those things are saying that more is gonna be required from employers. And there's obviously then the legal costs that go associated with uh, addressing sexual harassment in the workplace. It's, it's better to do it upfront than to have to pay for court cases. So the Respect at Work report talks a lot about how that current system is set up to be reactive and it's based on individuals bringing forward complaints. But relying on vulnerable individuals to make complaints who, as we've spoken about, are likely to be on the end, wrong end of a power imbalance. These things are not gonna result in the cultural change. So in this section of the webinar, I'm gonna talk in more detail about practical ways that we can address sexual harassment in the workplace. A lot of what we're going through today is going to be contained in that respective work report. So you can go back there for more details. I'm just gonna go through the highlights and also talk about some additional legal and practical considerations in the workplace. Overall, what needs to, to happen is cultural change, uh, where sexual harassment becomes unacceptable in workplaces um, in terms of those unwritten how we do things here when no one's looking particularly. Um, we here at HG can definitely help with undertaking a number of these practical considerations if needed, so feel free to come and talk to us. So as an overview, I'm going to talk today about undertaking a risk analysis the policy update, so that is still important, um, even though it's not going to be the be all and end all. And again, education and training. Uh, some other things that um, are not as common, things we haven't talked about in the past, is how do we involve the board or senior management in, uh, in sexual harassment strategies? And then communication and sharing of information um, once a complaint is received. So that, that will go through right from the beginning of when you receive a complaint to the outcome of the complaint and who knows about it throughout that process. How any of these will work for you will obviously depend on your business and uh, how your business is run. So risk analysis is the first thing. The first thing to do when looking to address sexual harassment is, is to address it like any other safety issue. Undertake a risk analysis so that the organisation can understand the issues um, and in, in particular workplaces or in their workplace and also where the high risks are. So we'll need to look at um, the risk factors, which include things like, well, as we've talked about, where are those power imbalances? Where is the gender inequality? Where are their minority groups? Where um, look at then, about, sorry, about who's more likely to be harassed? So again, those minority groups, where are our junior staff? Where are their females and perhaps not uh, large amounts of females? Where are their casuals whose work is insecure? And so they're again, uh, more um more vulnerable. 
And then, as we've talked about, those intersectional imbalances is what the respected work calls it. So, so if you're a female and you're also from a minority diverse group or you're um, um, from the LGB, LBGQTI, sorry, I always get the letters around the wrong way, um, or if you're a female and you have a disability. So looking at those kind of imbalances in the workplaces. And then the next thing is to look at, well, where are the high risk areas? Uh, where is my workplace male dominated? Where is there a very hierarchical workplace? Where is there a masculine workplace culture? Um, looking then uh, about other high risk areas are where there is a high level of customer or client contact, where there is again, that use of alcohol in the workplace. And lastly, where there are isolated work locations or remote work locations. So this will then include you looking at the potential likelihood of sexual harassment versus the impact of it um, in the business or, um, and you'll look at, sorry, in different areas of the business and across the business. Once the risks are under, understood, the organisation can then come up with plans and strategies to address these risks. Like any other workplace health and safety issue, you need to consider consulting with uh, your workers and with other management and involving them in the strategy. So this will give them buy-in and have the ability to have some input. So one of the quotes from the work, uh, Respect at Work report is that transparency is an effective, relatively low cost mechanism for engineering some positive change. So once people start to talk about this and normalize discussion about it in the workplace, demonstrates to workers and to leaders, uh, sorry, demonstrates to workers that the leaders understand and prioritize these issues. So this will then contribute to cultural change. Another uh, thing about engaging in consultation in the workplace is that if you are engaging with employees, it has the potential to reduce some backlash uh, for, from, um, often it will be men, um, from when you're introducing these changes. So I'm gonna look at some, in more detail about some practical changes, but just looking at those risk factors, some very, uh, simple changes you can make are things like limiting and reducing alcohol. I say simple, but I know that in some workplaces that would be um, quite an impact. Uh, if there are remote workers, considering the layout of the workplace accommodation, enhancing lighting. If there are customers, looking at campaigns to stop abuse um, and procedures or security, um, res security response and security issues. And then where your workers are seconded onto client sites working with clients to enhance safety and including some contractual terms that require them to look at this. So like any other safety risk, look at putting sexual harassment on the risk register. It needs to be considered with relevant scenario planning. Um, this is particularly important when you're looking at things like reputational harm that can be suffered from sexual harassment. So the next thing I'm gonna talk about is the policy update. So policies on their own, as we've talked about, are not likely to reduce sexual harassment. It's all about how they're implemented. But nonetheless, they are an essential part of addressing sexual harassment and reducing vicarious liability risks. Um, this is where employees go to look if something has happened to them. So it helps them to understand what is acceptable behaviour in the workplace and what to do if they are subject to um, unacceptable behaviour. Now is a really good time to review and update your sexual harassment policy, considering these recent changes to the law and considering the current environment. So what do you need to include in your policies? A lot of this stuff is similar to what we've talked about previously. However, it really, the shift in it is about what's your focus. The focus on equality and respect, focus on support for the victim or the complainant. Um, you also need to include some of those basic things so that sexual harassment is unlawful. So it's not just that the company doesn't want you to engage in sexual harassment, it's actually unlawful. Um, there needs to be a clear definition of what sexual harassment is and some practical examples of what it is. Uh, needs to say that it actually applies to all workers in the workplace, so volunteers, um, contractors, casuals, permanent staff. There needs to be some addressing of that online sexual harassment that John talked about earlier through digital technology. And then again, about how sexual harassment can occur outside the workplace and still be a part of the workplace. So still be disciplined as a part of the workplace and you can still be sued for sexual harassment, even if it doesn't occur straight in the workplace. 
Um, there needs to be a clearly described and robust complaint management process. So one that makes it as easy as possible for complainants to, to use. Um, needs some of those basics, again, about disciplinary action for employees who don't comply and um, when sexual harassment is proven, and also protection against ret retaliation, and that retaliation is not acceptable. You include uh, the external reporting mechanisms, and lastly, you need to check that it aligns with your other relevant policies, so your workplace health and safety policy, complaints management policy, your code of conduct, your whistleblowers policies. One last thing to consider putting in, and I'm gonna talk about this in more detail later, is whether a business is going to have an open communication policy about substantiated complaints and how that might look. Um, there are a lot of factors to consider in this and I'll go through that uh, in more detail later, but just putting that in your policy has the potential to uh, deter people from engaging in sexual harassment. So in terms of your policy, the next thing you've got to consider is how is it going to be implemented? How are your employees going to be aware of the policy and, um, and the business's position on sexual harassment? This is your opportunity to make a big bang, to have a policy launch, to have a marketing campaign of sorts. Um, so one thing that um, has been suggested is that you put a leadership statement out uh, um, from your senior management in support of your sexual harassment policy as it's launched. Then think about education, as we've spoken about, um, your, any advertisements you're going to do, some posters, how it will be made available, how can employees get access to it, how do they know where it is. Uh, and then just make sure you consider a variety of methods to um, suit your workplace. How are you then going to continue to make employees aware of it? So it's not just a one-off. How are you going to, again, we're talking about the posters, the stickers, the maybe pop-up reminders on your computer, emails, toolbox sessions, things like that. And of course, it needs to be included in induction at the workplace. Okay, so moving on then to the next point, which is about education and training. Um, so this is, this is us making sure that employees know what sexual harassment is. It may not be the one thing that creates behavioural change, but it's part of that holistic approach. When designing education and training, consider your target audience and whether you might need a slightly different program for different types of employees. So for example, um, it is really useful to have um, additional or a different training session for managers or supervisors which highlights their responsibilities in eliminating sexual harassment and also what they do if they if someone comes to them um, with a complaint or they see something in the workplace. For those um, managers, you also need to really highlight for them the power imbalance issue that we've spoken about before, the fact that they have that extra level of power and so they need to be really, really careful um, in the workplace that they use that power appropriately. Um, and that probably means triple checking uh, if you are looking at um, developing a relationship with a staff member, maybe quadruple checking to make sure that it's okay. Um, so other options to look at for different training might be about considering whether men and women should be separated. I do have some mixed feelings about that, but in some workplaces that might be appropriate. Um, and whether juniors or more vulnerable groups need to be given additional training. All workers need to go through this training. So whether they're permanent, contractors, volunteers, interns, labour hire, all these different people. Of course, this presents logistical nightmares for some um, HR people who have people across the whole state, but this is really important. Um, so there are some standard information that you do need to convey in these sessions. And most of this is really what we've talked about already that's in your policy. Training needs to be positioned as a business-driven initiative, something that is committed to by external by your high-level manager, and not that it's just some kind of mandatory training that people need to go to. Um, in my view, having senior management present uh, for that training, or at least opening the training or closing the training, can go a long way to showing their commitment to it. As with all training, uh, it's really about how you can engage with people and make sure that there are space for the attendees to think about how they're going to apply this information in the workplace. A relatively new area that's developing in sexual harassment training is the idea of bystander training. So it's designed to encourage people to act in response to workplace sexual harassment or any kind of harassment or discrimination generally when they see or hear it in order to um, prevent it and reduce its impact or the harm it causes. 
So this can be incorporated into your normal sexual harassment education session, or it could be also a separate session. Um, it's something for you to consider. Perhaps you might even want to alternate between the years. Bystander training treats all workers as allies who have the ability to intervene and stop sexual harassment or reduce the extent of harm it causes. Um, as with all these strategies, there are limitations to it. Uh, I was considering the other day when I'd heard about a friend who had um, had some inappropriate comments made to her and thinking about, would I say something to someone who was senior to me in the workplace if they um, said something inappropriate to one of my colleagues or one of my friends? And thinking through what you might say in those situations is, is really difficult. And so it's one of the part of the toolbox, again, about knowing what you might say and thinking about it before it happens. So the suggestions of what bystanders might be able to do, um, it varies depending on the level of influence and what the bystander might feel comfortable to. But it's um, at the, you know, the very least end, it might be actually saying something to the person who'd been harassed after the incident and saying to them, I didn't think that was okay. Or, um, you know, opening that conversation with that person showing some support. Um, it might even go through to talking to the harasser it might be just making a comment when the harasser has made an inappropriate joke. So something like, can you explain that joke or what decade are you living in? Or that's not funny. So some comments like that. This is the kind of thing that you um, talk about beforehand, practice beforehand so that people feel comfortable saying it. Um, as I said before, this is not just about sexual harassment. It's about discrimination generally because um, those power imbalances, those inequalities all feed into sexual harassment and feed into what your workplace culture is. Um, really important with training, back to basics, is making sure you keep good records of what training you've run, who's attended, and also um, and that, no, it doesn't, that also means keeping a record of what the training was that they attended. I've been in organisations where, you know, over a period of 10 years, the sexual harassment training has changed, you know, four or five times. So you need to make sure you have a record of each one so that we know which one that person has gone to so that when in, in the unfortunate, unlikely event that you go to court, you're able to say, well, this is the training we gave them. Um, of course, with all training, you want to include some kind of effectiveness assessment at the end of the training so that you can look at improvement for future, re future years. Um, now moving into the idea about how do we get board and senior management involved. I might be using those terms individual, uh, sorry, interchangeably, noting that some organisations have boards and some just have the senior management. As I said earlier, their commitment and to the strategies is vital. So um, it's important that employees understand that management's committed to sexual harassment elimination and to gender inequality elimination for the, then the employees who want to be committed to it. Management needs to lead from the front and they will drive any gender diversity issues um, or cultural change or strategies associated with that. So how do we get them involved? As a start, they need to be properly informed. So they are going to need similar education um, in relation to what is sexual harassment, what are their responsibilities um, as, as, a, as a manager will need. They also need high quality information given to them about what is going on in the organisation so that they can take that organisational pulse and think about those broader strategies. Um, it's been recommended from numerous industry bodies and again, that Respect at Work report um, that it should be an item on the board's agenda for consideration and discussion on a regular basis. So then it's about thinking if you are reporting to the board, what kind of information do they need and how do we deliver that in a way that's useful for them? So kind of information you might be looking at are gender um, inequality and diversity indicators. Um, so gender pay gaps, women in leadership, casualization of the workplace, particularly um, uh, the conversion rates to permanent um, employees, flexible work arrangements, attrition rates, um, all of these kind of, um, all this kind of data about gender inequality. Another thing that's important is looking at cultural indicators and, and then you might have some cultural surveys that you might undertake, employee engagement. So that's also female versus male engagement because um, if there's a low level of female engagement, there's more likely to be um, a risk there for you. Um, and there are a number of businesses can, that can conduct these cultural surveys, um, which at a high level will develop in um, designing these strategies. Other things you might um, that is worthwhile reporting is about general staff dis dissatisfaction. So complaints, um, we're looking at 
obviously we're talking about mainly sexual harassment complaints here at the moment, but generally um, complaints in the workplace, not just sexual harassment, indicate staff dissatisfaction, indicate some cultural problems. Um, and they may not be the best indicator, but they are something worth reporting on because obviously if you've got vulnerable employees, they may not be willing to come and talk about it. Um, so this will be including things like the number of complaints, the types of complaints, um, how they were dealt with, how long it took to deal with them, and then the outcomes for perpetrators and the complainants and um, settlement agreements if there are any. Perhaps in smaller organisations, the senior management level will actually be direct, directly involved in the management of sexual harassment complaints. Um, but of course, in all of these instances, confidentiality needs to be preserved. Um, so as I said, general report on workplace dissatisfaction is, will include things like related misconduct and grievances, so not just sexual harassment, and, and general complaints to HR even. Lastly, one more thing you might want to provide to your board is training numbers. So employees and managers, feedback on training, that kind of information. It's really important for this information to be concise and well thought out so that the board doesn't get 100 pages of HR information. Um, instead, they get you know five pages, which is summarised and is in a good uh, form that's easy for them to read. Another responsibility of boards is to ensure due diligence is conducted on potential employees at that senior management level. So this includes the good old reference check and Google check. I worked in an organisation once which required two pages of Google checks to make sure there was nothing in the deep dark history. Um, and also asking questions of candidates about how they've dealt with employee complaints in the past and how they've dealt with sexual harassment that may have occurred. Um, similarly with promotions, so making sure that the employees being promoted reinforces the commitment to gender equality and respectful behaviour in the workplace. Having a good framework for promotions in relation to this, which emphasises this behavioural conduct, um, is essential because others in the workplace definitely notice when someone is promoted if they've been the subject of many complaints. Okay, now to the last issue. This is about communication and sharing of information about sexual harassment. This is a really tricky um, issue and it's a big and vexed issue in many respects. So um, some of the answers about how and what to communicate will depend on the, on the situation. I'm going to start with uh, the, the somewhat simple area of communicating with a complainant and with a respondent, um, which at least is initially straightforward, and then talk more about open communication um, with your employees about situations that may have occurred. So firstly, where a complainant finally manages to bring a report of sexual harassment, there needs to be a lot of communication and support with them. Um, this is about that victim-centric words that they use or complainant-centric um, that some people like to use instead. So it's about listening to the complainant with no judgment, allowing the presence of support person, because it's obviously a very difficult situation to go through, but also being careful to be fair to the respondent in these conversations because a complainant cannot be accepted as proven until the respondent has had a chance to respond. Um, importantly, a complainant should be asked how they want their complaint to be handled and what outcome they're seeking. Um, whilst at the same time, you need to explain that we'll, their view will be definitely taken into account, but we need to look at the overall circumstances for deciding um, how to handle a complaint. And it's then up to the business to decide on how they're gonna handle the complaint but communication with the complainant can't stop there. And I've seen this happen in many instances where the complainant sits out on the side and doesn't know what's going on and the complaint takes months to be investigated. Um, and this leaves the complainant in a really bad position in terms of their um, ability to continue coping with the situation. Um, if an organisation wants to be victim centric or complainant centric, as the respected work report recommends, then communication support to the complainant needs to be regular throughout this process. Um, of course, at this stage of the situation, all um, information in relation to the complaint needs to be kept absolutely confidential as much as possible. And this is about uh, protecting the integrity of any investigation. Um, all parties need to be reminded of this requirement for confidentiality on a, on a regular basis. But that doesn't mean that the complainant doesn't get to know what's going on and doesn't mean that they can't talk with their immediate family or with their counsellor or, or maybe one or two support friends. Um, throughout the process, they could be consulted on many different things. So the first thing might be in the drafting of the allegations to be put to the respondent to make sure that they act, actually accurately reflect 
what the complainant is concerned about. Um, they can also be consulted in relation to who should be called as witnesses and be informed to an extent of the investigation and how it's going. Um, in some instances, a, um, a person might be appointed, so often it's a HR person or a supervisor, as the key communications person with the um, complainant because that means that one person takes responsibility and one person is um, puts in their diary that they need to talk with them on a regular basis, so however often it might be appropriate at that time. And make sure it doesn't fall under the radar. Also important is communication with the respondent. So remembering that the allegations haven't been proven, we don't leave people out to hang. Um, they need to be given a procedurally fair opportunity to respond to allegations against them. So just as it's difficult for a complainant to go through the process, it's obviously really difficult for a respondent as well. And it's important to, again, allow them to have a support person available to give them information about how the matter will be managed and the progress of any investigation. But again, all this is under the proviso of the information needing to be kept confidential. Supporting and communicating with the complainant and the respondent can go a long way to preventing successful work cover claims and preventing um, psychological injuries. But the more vexed issue about um, communication happens when there is an outcome to the complaint, where proven or partially proven or not proven. Do you communicate with the complainant? Do you communicate with the respondent? How do you communicate with the wider staff? Um, so again, let's start with the parties involved. So it used to be that outcomes were not provided or not provided in any detail to the complainant, mainly due to confidentiality reasons and avoidance of defamation. Um, however, this is now not considered to be best practice. A complainant should be told of the allegations that were eventually put to the respondent and at least a summary, if not um, the, a detail, of what allegations were substantiated or not substantiated and then what action is going to be taken, what disciplinary action is going to be taken. They can actually also be consulted about what's the wider action that needs to be taken more broadly across the organisation to address sexual harassment in the future. Um, where there is sexual harassment proven, particularly against senior managers or um, leaders, open communication with staff needs to be considered. So traditionally, this information was kept quiet. Um, both the victim and the perpetrator were being directed to keep this information confidential, mainly in order to protect the reputation of the company and also prevent any defamation claims that might come up. However, it's now considered that this blanket requirement for confidentiality protects perpetrators and it perpetuates sexual harassment rather and the behaviour rather than dealing with it out in the open. Um, so the Respect at Work considered some um, report, considered some comments made by Commissioner Kenneth Hayne um, during the Royal Banking Royal Commission. And in that he said that where a board of an organisation has identified misconduct amongst leaders and has, in response, imposed serious sanctions against those leaders, there are benefits to be gained from being transparent. And the Respect at Work report says that this is directly applicable to sexual harassment. <coughs> As an example, an all staff firm wide, for example, direct communication issued by CEOs following an investigation or a dismissal of a senior employee um, for, for alleged sexual harassment can show a clear and unambiguous signal that behaviours are not acceptable and will be dealt with. Um, However, equally, there can be situations where it's not going to be the best option to communicate openly. Um, whether to be open about and provide this information generally needs to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. And unfortunately, I can't give you an easy formula as to when that's going to be the best idea, but I can give you a list of factors to consider. Um, there are some different types of transparency. Some are easier than others. So the first one is what we've talked about before, which is sharing that aggregate data of employee complaints and sharing that with employees as well as with the board. Um, and then there's the next level about sharing about specific complaints. So when you're thinking about specific complaints and particular complaints, I should say, that there is a general push from society which expects transparency from business in relation to this. And this reflects the need to focus on psychological well-being of employees, of victims, and general um, workplace health and safety governance issues over the possibility of adverse publicity for an organisation or possible legal defamation claims. Um, it is a difficult decision to make, and often the decision will depend on the circumstances. So sharing about um, 
particular complaints in a lot of instances, unless you're a large organisation or um, a very public organisation, it will often mean just sharing with employees generally, uh, not with the general public. Um, and in most businesses, this information will be shared by just a confidential email, although of course a business always needs to be wary that um, firm-wide emails um, can find their ways to be on shared externally. So factors to consider. The first one is, was the conduct actually proven on the balance of probabilities? If not, or if only some of the conduct was proven, then it may actually be best not to openly communicate about the complaint. Or you need to be very circumspect about what was substantiated um, in order to avoid any kind of defamation claim. Often we have respondents who leave before an investigation is concluded, although some of the times you can nonetheless substantiate allegations even if they weren't there. Um, but if you can't prove an allegation through an investigation or by an admission, then real care should be taken with open communication due to that possible def defamation claim. Another really important factor is what does the victim want? This is a key point. If the victim wants confidentiality, then it's really important to respect this. It may be possible to speak to the victim about whether they'd be open to some forms of communication, so whether they'd be open to themselves being de-identified or um, not identifiable in some way, but obviously that's difficult in small organisations. Um, if the victim doesn't know if they might want to disclose in the future, well, it, can, it may actually be able to be left open to the victim to decide whether they want to. Um, over time, their perspective often changes in terms of whether they might want to disclose. Um, will there be any limits though put it on to um, a victim in terms of what they might communicate in the future? Retaining agency over the ability to tell a story in the future is a really important way for a victim to recover and ultimately ultimately um, get to a high level of well-being again. However, a company will want to have a think through, well, are we happy to not hear about that they're going to communicate and all of a sudden it comes out in the press? How are we going to manage that? Um, so. The next, that leads me on to the next point, which is what is the reputational damage that you're looking at here? Is it better to be upfront and communicate right at the beginning um, openly about the situation um, and face whatever reputational damage might come out of that? Or are you going to face worse reputational damage if it comes out in the future? Another thing to think about is what will be the impact on the workplace culture and workplace health and safety if you do or you don't um, disclose this information? So are there gonna be rumors flying around which are actually worse than the truth um, or the very basics of the truth? Sometimes communicating the outcomes can send a message to staff that complaints are taken seriously and certain behaviors won't be tolerated. And this is again, particularly important where senior management are the perpetrators. Another important point to look at is, do you have a high quality report, investigation report that can withstand scrutiny? While we haven't spoken about investigation reports or investigations much in relation to sexual harassment, they are obviously a key point, key way to manage complaints. Um, really, it's a huge issue, so unfortunately, we're not able to spend much of time, a lot of time on it. But having a quality investigation to rely upon is vital. Uh, um, if you have any questions about the way the investigation was run or the report, then the business may not be able to withstand scrutiny in relation to an unfair dismissal claim or in relation to a defamation claim. And so perhaps then communication should be more limited. How serious is the sexual harassment is my next point. I'm, to an extent, I'm loath to describe seriousness of sexual harassment since just simple comments can still be very detrimental to individuals' mental health and they can be cause for dismissal. However, if we're, for example, looking at there's one or two comments that someone has made, that may be an instance where it's more appropriate to simply counsel and warn the person um, and try and repair relationships between the um, the parties, then it is actual. Then, then then there's not going to be as much benefit to going public at that point. And the last point I'm going to talk about is about the potential for a def defamation claim. Again, defamation is another topic in itself. So I'm, due to time, I'm not going to be able to speak about it in detail. However, the first thing to say about this is that the ability for an everyday individual to pursue a claim of defamation is actually somewhat limited. So this being a high risk factor um, for everyday employees is probably not something that's worth considering in a great amount of detail. Um, of course, the more senior the employee, the more likely it is that they will be able to take on this. And this is really due to the, the 
the cost and the difficulty of pursuing legal actions of this case of this type. Um, there are ways, though, that an organisation can position itself so that um, it can defend a sexual harassment claim. So some very carefully worded emails um, that will set you up for defences. So if you are looking at making these um, making this open communication, then have a good think about how you can avoid some defamation claims. So weighing for disclosure with consent of the victim, of course, is that it ensures that patterns of behaviour become apparent. So this can stop those serial offenders that go from organisation to organisation. And this is one of those things that we were talking about right at the beginning, which was the Harvey Weinstein affair and how he was able over a period of three decades to continue with some really inappropriate behaviour that was very damaging because there was multiple numbers of non-disclosure agreements with employees. Um, I think I heard that there was at least eight and that was only in you know the past 10 years or so. So it obviously was an ongoing problem and the non-disclosure agreements perpetuated the issue because no one spoke about it. Um, so this term, non-disclosure agreements, you may have heard about it um, in the context of sexual harassment as they've been under significant scrutiny. Typically, they're part of a whole um, settlement agreement um, whereby an employee agrees not to sue a business or make any harmful statements about the business in return for payment of a settlement sum, amongst other things. So um, it is a usual term of a non-disclosure agreement that there's some addressing of confidentiality. So the problem with this is, as we spoke about earlier, is it's not victim-centric. It's about protecting the business and the perpetrator and potentially results in a cover-up of some serious um, governance issues in workplace health and safety. If a victim wants to speak, should they be allowed to? Well, why should they have to keep it quiet? Do they have to keep any other workplace health and safety issues that happen quiet? Usually not. So interestingly, um, if we think back to some that, oh, sorry, as I was talking about before, that well-published Harvey Weinstein affair, we were talking about the, the catalyst for that Me Too movement and his ongoing non-disclosure agreements. This kind of complete confidentiality in non-disclosure agreements has the potential to cover up some bad behaviour. So at a minimum, um, even if it's decided that confidentiality is necessary, an NDA should not be in absolute terms, um, as it has been historically. We need to think about things like allowing someone to speak with regulators. Um, so for example, in the um, Respect at Work report, and uh, there was there's comments made about people not being able to tell their story. So at the very least, they should be able to de-identify and tell their story to regulators. They need to be able to speak to health professionals, to lawyers, to accountants, and they need to be able to speak to close family and friends and their support network, so long as they agree to confidentiality. This sounds really basic, but these are actually things that have not been included in many deeds that I've seen in the past, um, where it's just a blanket. You're not allowed to talk to anyone other than people who are your immediate family and your tax accountant, essentially. Um, looking more broadly, though, if an organisation is prepared to allow a complainant to speak openly, then a non-disclosure agreement takes on a, a completely different form. It looks about what clear uh, what information is confidential so for example it may be that the settlement sum is confidential um, and another thing may be the name of the victim if the victim um, wants that th that that is kept confidential it may include a carve out for an organization to be able to make certain information public so for example de-identifying the complaint um, to include in aggregate data at the very least or perhaps being able to name the perpetrator but not the victim um, unless they decide then to share. Um, and, the, and the last point is to actually, as we've talked about before, if a victim does decide to share publicly, what will the business be able to say in response? Um, will there be open communication for all? Or will there be some restrictions on that communication such that, for example, the um, complainant needs to notify the business if they intend to make information public? Well, that's all I have to say about um, open communication. So just in conclusion today, we've, we have been through the general law update. John went through that with you with legislative changes and some case law. And now I've just gone through some practical steps. HG can assist with um, pretty much all of these practical assets. We definitely um, help on a regular basis with complaint management, with conducting investigations, with policy development, um, and also training for staff. And the, and of course, those really tricky areas we just talked about, which is about information sharing and defamation. Um, we do also have a section within HG, which is called Effective Governance, and they specialise in um, board and senior management governance. So 
um, they will be able to assist you with developing reporting frameworks for the board and for senior management so that that information is actually really useful for the board and not just piles of pieces of paper. They can help with cultural change, cultural analysis, some diversity targets um, and other government reporting that's required. We also have a whistleblowers program so that can help with training and also with a hotline for, uh, for businesses if they need a whistleblowers hotline. Um, so that's all I've got to say for you today. Um, we have got some questions which um, I will go through very briefly. I think I'll only be able to address one question at this point in time, unfortunately. Um, the first one is what to do when a complainant doesn't want a complaint of sexual harassment investigated. This is a really vexed issue and it goes into that area of investigation that we were talking about earlier. Um, and it becomes down to being a really difficult balancing act between what the complainant wants against the employer's duty of care. The employer will always have a duty of care, even if the employee doesn't want the complaint to be investigated. Essentially, employers on notice at that point of this potential workplace health and safety issue, and they need to do something. Um, they've got a positive duty to assess the risks and identify what can be done to reduce or eliminate the risks. So this may mean that the um, organisation does need to do some kind of investigation. Um, in any event, I don't recommend that a business does nothing. Um, they need to, to look at what they're going to do and how they're going to manage it and, um, and support that complainant the best way they can. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. Um, so thank you very much for attending and thank you for sending in all your questions. Um, there are some more questions there, so we'll continue to address them over the next little while. Right. So thank you and see you later. Thank you, everyone. Cheers.